I'm so delighted to welcome you to the first of the 2021 British Library Food Season sponsored by KitchenAid. My name is Polly Russell and I'm the founder and the curator of the Food Season, working very closely with my friend and partner in crime, crime uh, the uh, season's guest director, Angela Clutton. This is the fourth year that we have run a food season at the British Library and like the other years we have an eclectic bunch of events which will explore every aspect of food. This year we're going to delve into the history of pies, new food media, exhibiting food, food writing, food and masculinity, food and class and food and cheese and the politics of coffee there's a lot going on. Please join us for other food season events and check out all about them on the British Library's website. There's a link at the bottom of this page. On the same page that you're viewing, you'll also find um, details about the wonderful food season competition that we're running with KitchenAid, where you can win a cordless KitchenAid appliance, uh, a place on a virtual cooking course, and uh, the wonderful Pie Room book by Callum Franklin. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. Please do use the menu on your screen to provide us with feedback about this event. We really like to hear from you. There's also a donate button. Um, the British Library is a charity and we rely in part on your support to help us do the work that we do. Uh, there's also a bookshop tab on the screen so you can browse and buy books from our guests this evening and you'll find social media links at the bottom of the page should you want to continue the conversation on other platforms. Please also throughout the event do post questions for Harold and Tara. They would love to hear from you. There'll be an opportunity where Harold will answer your questions. You can do that again at the bottom of your screen so please do think about that as you're listening to them talk. Right, now about this evening. I just could not be more pleased or more proud that the season's first event features the legendary Harold McGee coming to us all the way from his home in San Francisco, California, discussing his extraordinary new book, Nosedive, with the wonderful food writer, Tara Wigley. I'm going to let Tara introduce Harold properly, but I just want to say a few words about Tara. Tara started out working in publishing before switching to food writing just over a decade ago. She trained at the Ballymallow Cookery School in Ireland and then worked with Yota Makalengi testing recipes before taking the role of being a writing collaborator. Tara was involved with the creation of books, including Plenty More and Nopi, the cookbook suite. She's the co-author with Ottolenghi of the runaway success cookery book, Simple. And so she's almost a daily presence in my family kitchen and probably in many of your kitchens too. Her culinary expertise and understanding of flavour make her the perfect person to talk to Harold about his work and his new book. Now, just before we hand over to Tara, there is going to be a very brief tribute to Harold from the one and only Heston Blumenthal, uh, whose life work, as he will explain, was profoundly influenced by Harold and his first book on food and cookery. So I'm handing momentarily over to Heston and then Tara is going to take over. Thanks so much. Enjoy this evening. Hello, British Library Food Season. I am very honoured, chuffed and excited to introduce my great friend and somebody that has really changed my life both professionally and personally and preciously is still very much in it like a valuable jewel Harold McGee. If I could sum up the impact that Harold and his book had on my not only my career my life the way I view the world including very very importantly myself it's question everything, the importance of questioning. Thanks to that approach, I've discovered so much more about myself and in turn so much more about the planet and the universe and the sensorial world around me. I don't know how different my approach to food, my life in food, because um, it's very important for me cooking and eating. Um, I don't know what direction it would have taken if I had not have fallen down, this is gonna sound really dodgy, but Harold McGee's rabbit hole. <laughs> um, the chances are, the chances are it would have been quite different. I might have found something else that would have triggered the importance of questions, 
as opposed to answers. Um, but because it was over, it challenged something so set in chef's bloods that I, you have to brown meat to keep in juices. It's something so obvious and so simple. The example of it was, oh my word, if this isn't correct, how many other things in classical and modern classical cooking also are not correct? Or maybe they were correct, but the ovens have changed or the pots and pans have changed or the ingredients have changed, who knows? So it was the, the magic, if we, it, it's, it's so profound for me, this discovery. There's, there's many important great things about this book. It is like on food and cooking. It is a weighty. It's, it's a weighty tone. If you just walked to your local post office, there'll be smell of tarmac. There might be smell of freshly cut grass. There might be smell of rubber from the wheels of a car. There might be someone's perfume. That's a really complex world that can trigger all sorts of memories and emotions. All we need to do is become aware. And I think this book is a magnificent tool for anyone, whether they're interested in cooking or not, but the power and the complexity of smell, it is our world around us. I love that intro from, uh, from Heston and love the idea of us all going down rabbit uh, Harold McGee's rabbit hole. Um, so Harold McGee, uh, needs little introduction from me but I'll just give you a little bit of background. He studied at Caltech in Yale and since 1980 has been writing about the science of food cooking. He's the author as Heston was saying of the epic, inspiring, comprehensive and award-winning on food and cooking, the science and law of the kitchen which made us all, as Heston said, question everything. Um, and Harold often talks about paying attention and this idea of questioning everything and paying attention is just, it's, it seems so basic, but it's so revolutionary when you, when you start sniffing and smelling. Um, he's a visiting lecturer at Harvard University's course from Haute Cuisine to Soft Matter Science, a former columnist for the New York Times. He's been named Food Writer of the Year by Bon Appetit magazine. And in the Time 100, an annual list of the world's most influential pe people. He is, I'm sure, a very smart guy who uh, is very skilled at giving smart answers to often silly questions a lot of us have about quotidian life. Um, one of the amazing things I think about on food and cooking is that it was written without the aid of Google or Google Scholar. Um, and I just want to take the chance before we start, Harold, to say uh, on behalf of all of us, thank you for being our Google, because just as we can't imagine what we do before Google, we none of us can imagine what we did before Harold McGee and your Bibles that you give us. So thank you and uh, looking forward to chatting. And as Polly says, uh, if you've got any questions, pop them down and then we'll save them up for, for the end and we can all find out, for, all find out why our we smells of asparagus or horrible after we eat asparagus and all such other things, other questions that we have. Um, but on to nosedive. Um, so I love the fact that Harold, you spent 10 years researching and writing a book that is 700 pages long, that uh, has a time span of 14 billion years, um, but you still felt compelled to uh, invent one new word. You felt like there was room for one more. Um, so I was hoping you might start us off with telling us what this word is and what it means and how it sort of encompasses your ambition for this, this book, Nosedive. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Tara and Polly and Heston. Um, boy, I'm... Um, my, my heart is beating fast <laughs> with all, all of those wonderful words. Thank you so much. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. And, um, you know, I couldn't do what I do without libraries. So it's just wonderful to be doing an event that um, in, in some way supports one of the great libraries of the world. Uh, anyhow, so, uh, yeah, I, uh, when I started writing about smell, I kept finding myself um, uh, saying the world of smells over and over again. How amazing is the world of smells? And let's explore this corner of the world of smells. 
I, I just felt that there should be a word that encompasses that uh, that idea, the the world of smells. And so I have a, a um, brother-in-law who is a professor of classics, and I consulted with him on several possibilities, several coinings uh, from, you know, Greek and Latin roots and so on. He vetoed most of them, but he allowed osmocosm, uh, osmo from uh, Greek root meaning smell and cosm, of course, the, the cosmos. So um, I made us word os osmocosm to describe the world of smells. And that's what I tried to explore in the book. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the, the ambition is extraordinary. The, the subtitle is A Field Guide to the World Smells. And this book is, is quite literally uh, a field guide to every smell and you cover a lot of ground. Um, we have the smells of planet earth, of animals, we have land plants, we have waters, we have fruit, we have humans, we have quite a lot on human excrement and we have, before we get to kind of food and wine, but um, the initial spark for the book 10 years ago uh, did come down to a certain meal with a certain chef and, and your experience eating one particular type of food. So. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about this this spark that took place ten years ago. Yeah, and uh, it's it's wonderful that uh, Heston is kind of with us this evening because um, back in two thousand four, when I finished uh, the revision of On Food and Cooking, I uh, I you know lifted my head from my desk and realized that the world of food had really changed a lot in the last few years that I'd been writing. And I talked with Heston about this and he said, you know, you really need to come over here and, and visit some of these places that are doing interesting things. So I, I took up his invitation and he and I went around to a variety of places in Spain and the UK and so on, um, uh, exploring restaurants that were really pushing uh, the idea of novelty, of, you know, making a really memorable meal out of surprising you so that you would, you would really remember that moment. Um, and it was fascinating, uh, but the last meal I had was at um, uh, Fergus Henderson's restaurant, St. John. It happened to be the very beginning of grouse season and I'd, I'd never had a grouse before. So I ordered grouse for lunch and um, very, very traditional meal, you know, it was just roasted with a tuft of watercress coming out of its behind. And uh, it just blew me away in, in a way that none of the, the novel meals that I'd had at the avant-garde restaurants had done. Uh, and it did so, so powerfully that for a couple of minutes, I couldn't, uh, I could barely speak. I was sitting chatting with other people and I just had to stop and pay attention to what was going on in my mouth. And uh, that, that um, the, the power the, that my senses had over my mind at that moment really got me to thinking about the, uh, the nature of flavor, uh, how it is that uh, that that kind of power is exerted, and what it what could it possibly be in this um, this cooked bird that could affect me so strongly? And so that started me down, uh, I guess, my own rabbit hole <laughs> of uh, trying to figure out what it was about uh, flavor that could be so interesting and so powerful. And it was so interesting to me that you had such a powerful response to it because a lot of us think that our relationship with food and the, the power of it is tied up with memory um, and the fact that you'd never had this grasp before meant that you had no memory to draw on um, and and then that, that sort of and so it's interesting because we think of it as being so subjective and and you I think made the wise decision not to go down the the the, the rabbit hole that would have been an entire warren of kind of the subjective relationship of food and memory and you would have had to have a kind of 12 volume book and then that got you onto the firmer ground of of uh, your interest in flavor echoes and the mystery of why certain unrelated foods mirror one another on the palate and um and i wondered if you could tell us a bit about the flavor 
echoes and why this is of such interest and maybe if you have a kind of a flavor echo yourself that you're particularly tickled by I know that mine is the the sort of when I realized that my dog's paws smelt like tortilla chips and this was I sort of found this confirmation in the book and I've always thought it was kind of popcorn or to tortilla chips but yeah if you could talk a bit about these flavor echoes that'd be really interesting. Yeah, well, that's that's really what led me to uh, the idea. It led me from the the idea of writing about flavor to the idea of writing about the smells of the world, because initially I thought, okay, this was a powerful experience. I want to understand it better. We now have begun to understand how the brain perceives things like taste and smell. So I'll write a book about flavor. Uh, but then as I began to do that, I began to realize that some of the most interesting things about flavor are in fact these echoes, these, these um, whiffs of other things in the world in the foods th that we eat that may be other foods or they may be something uh, entirely inedible. Uh, you know, a, a well-aged Parmesan cheese uh, can smell like pineapple. And so you have kind of half rotten cow's milk on the one hand and a ripe tropical fruit on the other. What, what do they have in common? Why do they have this, this kind of relationship? Or of course, wine tasters uh, taste all kinds of things in wines. Flowers are, you know, they're, they're not especially edible, but they're kind of pleasant. Um, but then sweaty saddles <laughs> is another term uh, for uh, particular qualities in red wines. And it's true that there is a kind of leathery aspect to, to some red wines. So it was, it was those kinds of um, correspondences that really led me to realize that in order to understand flavor, I had to understand why these other things in the world have the qualities that they do. And that ended up shifting my focus altogether so that flavor is, you know, a, it's a portion of this book, but, but only a portion. And I do delve into dog's paws to try to understand why it is that they, they have these um, qualities that, that really strike us. When you asked your editor for an extension on the deadline. Um, and maybe we should talk a bit about kind of what smell is and and you know I was talking with my kids today about smell and it feels like you know it feels like taste they can kind of list all the different tastes that we've got and um, it's something they understand but it but smell when you actually talk about it it's kind of almost a bit of a neglected sense and yet it's our most direct sense and it's it's much more maybe maybe we we uh, ignore it because it's sort of so much more complex than taste but when I was giving my kids today some of the kind of statistics about the number of receptors or the number of possibilities it was kind of mind-blowing and it feels like it's it's a bit of a sort of un, undiscovered sense not undiscovered but not you know but people aren't kind of as it's, it's taken kind of nosedive to blow my mind about smell and sort of and sort of how that's and why that's happened yeah well it it really is true that in in western culture smell has been devalued compared to sight and to hearing. So, you know, we, we can make art, visual art, we can make music uh, with smells, we can make perfumes, um, but, but um, you know, that's, that's been a relatively minor part of our culture, of, of our heritage. It's very different, by the way, in, in the East, where incense and perfume have been taken much more seriously uh, for and, and continuously for, for thousands of years. Um, but it is the case that, uh, you know, in, in, even though vision and hearing are, have their interest, um, I like to point out the fact that both of them are very indirect indications of what's going on around us. You know, their light is being reflected off of surfaces or uh, pressure waves are, f are coming through the air from an object that has moved. But in the case of smell, we're actually detecting little bits of the actual things around us. Uh, smells are molecules that are escaping from these material things and uh, flying through the air and into our nose and momentarily becoming part of us as we actually detect them. And of course, the things of the world are 
uh, many, many, many. And so the smells of the world are many, many, many. And we have enough receptors and the brain power to, to be able to distinguish uh, thousands, maybe tens of thousands, maybe we, we, we actually really don't know <laughs> the theor theoretical limit of the number of smells that we could possibly detect. So it is this very powerful uh, connection that we have to the world around us uh, that, that has been neglected, but happily is becoming more prominent. Mm. I, love, I love the way you, you employ your readers throughout the book to become better smell explorers. And I just love this idea of kind of scout leader, Harold McGee leading all these kind of smell explorers behind him. And I definitely, I feel like I'm smelling more. And, uh, and again, you know, the, this, this idea that it's actually volatile molecules of the things coming off into my nose was just was something I'd never, I'd never thought about. But just as the scope of your book changed a lot um, from, your, from where, you, where you started, the world in which it's published in 2020 is obviously very different from the one you imagined. Um, and I wondered whether you could talk about the impact of of, uh, of the entire world having had their nose literally barred from, from smells for a whole year, um, whether you think there's going to be some kind of uh, collective olfactory euphoria when we have our masks um, taken off, whether you think we might become better um, smellers or whether you um, know any more about the research that's going into people whose smell, it's not that they've stopped smelling, it's they're still smelling, but their brain is is interpreting incorrectly and they're smelling kind of awful things like kind of burning plastic or something rather than food and I know there's a crowdfunding group called Absent which I've heard you talk about elsewhere I didn't know if you if you knew any more about 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 that research. Yes so uh, when I started writing about smell 10 years ago I had no idea that uh, smell would be um, uh, so so severely affected for so many people uh, when, when my book actually saw the light of day. And um, it's, uh, you know, there are different, um, different aspects to this. One is that because uh, it turns out that the loss of the sense of smell is a very early symptom of COVID infection. And because uh, sometimes that smell uh, takes a long time to come back uh, or is deranged. Um, so as you say, you smell something that should smell either neutral or nice, but in fact, people with, um, with what's called parosmia smell terrible smells, um, which are not actually there. Um, so the fact that this has become a kind of public health issue has meant that there is now much more attention being paid to the sense of smell in the medical and the scientific communities. Uh, it's unfortunate that it took this to kind of uh, make that happen, but I, I think in the long run, it's going to be very helpful. It's, you know, it, one of the ways we understand how the body works is by investigating what is going on when it's not working so well. And so I think eventually this is going to lead to a much greater understanding of, um, of our sense of smell. Uh, and then, yeah, we're, we're, when we have to wear masks, then we're both blocking the smells uh, in the world around us from reaching our nose, and we're becoming way too acquainted with our own smells, the smell of our breath that's being trapped in the, in the fabric. Uh, and so I think for, for many people, it, it, it really does, because it is such a change, um, uh, highlight the fact that this is an, an important part of our everyday life. And also simply the relief, uh, I certainly feel this all the time, the relief of finally taking off your mask and then being able to breathe in the world around you, I think um, just, just helps us appreciate the fact that uh, fresh air is a, a wonderful thing. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was just saying before we came on air that I, you know, we had a, me and my husband had a different meal on Friday night to the food we're normally eating and we got a sort of takeout from a restaurant. And um, 
And it just made us realize how sort of institutionalized we've become in just the flavors that we're, we're sort of eating, cooking at home the whole time. But it's, it's the same with smell. Not only are we sort of barred off from, from, from the volatile molecules going into our nose, we're just, we're not experiencing the world and going to different places. So, so, you know, we all talk about becoming a bit institutionalized and it's sort of, it is, but, um, and, and, and you lost your sense of smell during the course of writing the book. Was that, do you mind me asking, was that, that was COVID related or was that, was that separate? No, that, that happened maybe five years ago. Okay. Uh, uh, so in the midst of writing a book about smell, I lost mine and that was scary. <laughs> uh, and it took a couple of months to come back. And um, I, I asked my friends in the olfactory community, uh, the moment I noticed um, coming down to make coffee one morning and realizing that the the coffee tasted bad and that was the bitterness and the astringency were still there, but the aroma was was gone. Uh, I, I asked my friends, "How can I uh, treat myself? Should I go see a doctor? Uh, when will it come back?" And they basically said, uh, "There's there's nothing you can do about it. We really don't know that much about it." Uh, usually it comes back, but sometimes it doesn't. So just kind of hang on and, um, and hope for the best. And it did take a couple of months. Uh, and they, those were very, very unhappy months. <laughs> wow. Um, cripes. Well, that's a, that's a happy ending. <laughs> just a slightly dramatic turn of events halfway through you writing a 10 year book. Um, and COVID aside, uh, is is there a way are there ways in which we can become better smellers um is it something that we can kind of train ourselves to do do we have a kind of inner bloodhound that we can train up or learn from breathing techniques of of dogs is it something we can become better at doing and then leading to a, a heightened sense of, of palate and appreciation of of food yeah, it's uh, it's uh, pretty straightforward, you know. Just smell more, <laughs> and 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 pay attention to what you're smelling, and um, you know it can be as simple as you know Heston mentioned walking down the street and smelling the tarmac and smelling uh, uh, around here in my neighborhood. I when I'm out in the evening. I can smell people cooking in their kitchens, and I try. I stop and try to figure out from my own experience what are those smells coming from. You know, is it a frying pan, and what's in the frying pan? That kind of thing. Um, but you can also be more systematic about it, uh, and I think it can be rather than being, a, you know, a kind of uh, a self-imposed training session. It can just be a lot of fun to take five bottles off of your spice rack, for example, and just reacquaint yourself one by one with those smells. Um, what I find is that usually my uh, spice rack is full of bottles that no longer have any smell because they're so old. And so it's a <laughs> reason to, to refresh them. But you can also do things like, um, you know, if you uh, happen to enjoy Indian food, uh, take down the bottles that would go into a spice blend for a particular dish, and then uh, open a bottle of um, uh, the blend that you've already made from those spices, or go ahead and make them fresh, and then notice how the, the composite is so different from the individual components. But yet, if you really work at it, you can, you can pick out the fenugreek, you can pick out the, the cumin. Um, we, we tend to think of the smells of food and drink and things in general as um, just, you know, themselves, a kind of uh, overall impression. But in fact, they're, they're kind of like chords in music. They're made up of all these different notes of these different molecules that have gone into them. And by uh, taking advantage of the, the wonderful collections that we have in our own kitchens, we can begin to become more sensitive to those notes and to how they build to make chords and then carry that experience out into the world at large. Yeah. Again, that's sort of such a, it seems so uh, sort of 
obvious when you say this, something I've never sort of questioned before. I've just sort of thought that a lemon smells of a lemon and that there is a smell that is lemon or strawberry and vice versa. And that sort of takes takes sort of reading a book to realise that that's just this nonsense. It's 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 cords, it's a bouquet, as you say. Um but so do you you don't think we can learn something from dogs and the way they're they're smelling? Like is it like what's what's happening with their their kind of frequent sniff, 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 sniff? Is it that they have more smell receptors than us or are they just better at sort of they, they smell things more intensely or is it the sort of is there something about the quick smelling text uh, sort of sniffing in and out technique that we can learn from i just want to get everyone to get sort of sniffing sniffing their keyboards as they're their dogs collectively <laughs> Well, yeah, so it, it turns out, you know, we, we all have this general sense that animals are much better smellers than we are, dogs in particular, because of, you know, bloodhounds and following trails and that kind of thing. But in recent years, scientists have actually taken a look at that and asked the question, uh, how sensitive are other animals compared to us at detecting particular molecules? And the answer is, we're all kind of about the same. Mammals kind of have the same uh, abilities. Um, what matters is sort of the, the experience, the day-to-day the -day, uh, development of that, that kind of muscle in our uh, uh, set of abilities. So of course, for, for dogs, which are a few inches off the ground and aren't getting a lot of information through their eyes, um, their world is mostly smell. And so they're acutely sensitive to small variations in things and they're sniffing rapidly all the time because that's just the, the most important sense for them. We're a few feet above the ground. It's not so important for us, um, but uh, we can take advantage of their example by, yeah, by sniffing frequently, um, something that I learned actually from my son uh, is that, uh, who, who I guess just kind of uh, figured it out on his own, that if you're um, in savoring a glass of wine or something like that, you can get very different aspects of it by starting far away from the glass and then sniffing quickly and getting closer and closer and closer to it. And the, you, you get different aspects of the wine's aroma at different distances from the from the right. uh, edge of the glass so there are lo lots of different ways uh to to do that uh to to um you know just to to get more information into our noses and into our brains so that we perceive more of what's actually going on around us yeah so i've just seen a question from angela who was saying it sort of links to it she's saying how if at all do our other senses impact upon our sense of smell. So again, I wonder if dogs, if they're just all about the kind of the smell and the food, that's, you know, they're, they're sort of very good at that, but whether it means that other senses are, are sort of not playing into it so much or, or sort of, yeah, so how much our other senses do, do impact things? Well, it, uh, yeah, it's, it's certainly the case that, um, you know, we were designed by evolution, not just to smell things, but to, perceive the world around us and uh, as, as a kind of uh, overall unified um, perception to know whether things are okay or not okay, whether to change course or keep going the way we're going. Uh, and so it's, it's actually a, a kind of um, uh, unnatural abstraction for us to focus just on smell and divorce it from taste or uh, try to talk to ignore what our eyes are telling us you know in in um, uh, in judging foods wines cheeses olive oils things like that oftentimes uh, it the uh, competition will ask you to do these things blindfolded so that your other senses don't interfere with your sense of taste and smell and your your judgment uh, but that's so crazy because it, it uh, you know, take, takes the experience of taste and smell and isolates it in a way that has nothing to do with our everyday experience of these things. 
So they all do play. I've never been attracted to the idea of, of sort of sitting in a restaurant and you can go there and it's sort of in pitch dark and just focus on the food. But it's just never appealed to me on all levels. And and I also find it really discombobulating. It's like if you're trying to watch a, a movie and then you're eating at the same time. I just find it very odd not to be able to see what I'm eating. And so it just yeah, it shows how it's all linked. Um, fascinating. Um, and uh, I mean, we said before that that COVID has given us a big reason to all think and about uh, smell and, and hopefully it'll be something we all sort of talk about more but it's it's also a kind of big business I read a sort of about sort of scented candles business being just worth something like four netting four billion by 2024 um, and I wondered whether you had any predictions about how smell will be used by um, sort of industry or sort of kind of home comfort or tech or um entertainment whether smell will be part of our 4d experience um if we're watching television or in the cinema or or do you, do you think there's sort of new frontiers that heston and the rest of the world are going to take us to with smell <laughs> Well, uh, back in the 1970s, before, before I even started writing about food, I remember going to a movie uh, by uh, American director John Waters. The movie was called Polyester, and it came with a scratch and sniff card. And so at certain points in the movie, you were meant to smell what you were seeing on the, on the screen. And I just found uh, that scratch and sniff card a couple of months ago in my... Uh, boxes of various things, and they they're still there. The smell has still come out when you when you scratch them. Um, so it, it's been something that uh, people have tried to do for a long time to sort of add the sense of smell to these these other um, experiences that we can uh, be entertained by or or enjoy. There have been smell operas. Um, uh, and uh, things like that, they have generally not been terribly successful, partly because, you know, dealing with um, light waves or sound waves, uh, that's one thing, but actually dealing with little bits of matter that come into your nose and then they have to be kind of dissipated before you can enjoy the next one. Uh, it's, it's just a very different kind of medium. Uh, that said, there's a lot of interest these days in digitizing smell, in finding some way of uh, sending a signal uh, through, the, uh, through the air to somebody's computer, which might have a little you know, USB unit attached to it, which would respond and release a set of molecules that would imitate the smell that was at the other end of the, of the system. Uh, Again, not a lot of success so far, but people are really interested in doing it. And, uh, and the research is turning out to be very interesting because it's telling us about how you can, um, uh, how you can um, imitate the smell of an actual thing in the world with just a couple of molecules that you've figured out using uh, machine learning, for example, can trigger your or trick your receptors into thinking that it's that same molecule interesting. so in, interesting things coming <laughs> yeah interesting i got some sort of business cards last year where um it was uh it had sort of things like beer and bread and eggs and you could it was a scratch and sniff thing again and it was meant to help um tell you whether something was going off um, so rather than just looking at uh, the expiry date, you could tell by the smell. And I had it on the fridge for a while and it was quite novel. And that was just interesting to think that could, could help against food waste. So rather than people kind of blindly following, following dates. Um, but all this talk of scratch and sniff reminds me that uh, I must ask when the scratch and sniff version of Nosedive is coming out, that we're obviously all very much looking forward to. <laughs> we had a book at Ozilengi that had a great big... Um, Lemon, that's simple that on the cover, and I was uh, I was lobbying to get that scratch and sniff, but uh, but the publisher didn't go for it. Um, there's been lots of questions about something that I wanted to ask about a little bit earlier about about there's one about why do spices release smells when they get hot, and another question about how does the temperature, either ambient or material being smelled tasted, affect our ability to identify different smells? And it reminded me that I wanted you to expand on the example you give of 
of sugar in the book and how what happens to sugar when it's heated is just a really useful way of sort of people like me who are not scientifically minded to sort of understand what is happening uh, when heat is applied and, and the volatile molecules and how such complexity can come from something so initially simple when it because sugar doesn't have a smell when it's not by itself. Yeah, so uh, writing this book about smell in general really um, uh, enriched my understanding of cooking uh, in a way that I hadn't anticipated. Because if you think about it, you know, we, we mostly eat uh, plant and animal materials. They're made up of uh, very large molecules that are too large actually to fly through the air and into our nose. So they don't have any aroma to speak of. The, the aromas that they develop in cooking develop when uh, we use heat, the energy in heat, to break apart those large molecules into smaller fragments that are small enough to fly through the air and into our nose. And to me, the, the primo example of uh, that kind of alchemy is uh, caramel. So you start with uh, one single molecule, sucrose, um, uh, which has no aroma whatsoever. It tastes sweet, that's it, doesn't have any other tastes, and it's white, and it's a crystal, a solid. And you simply uh, add an energy in the form of heat and let it go for a few minutes, and first the, the solid melts, and now you have a liquid, and then the liquid begins to uh, develop an aroma, and then it begins to develop a color, and then you end up uh, after a few minutes with your kitchen just filled with this, um, you know, uh, irresistible aroma of, of caramel. And if you taste it, not only do you enjoy that aroma, but the flavor now includes not just sweetness, but sourness, acids have been created, bitterness, uh, savoriness. Uh, so this, you, you start with one molecule, you end up with it turns out hundreds and hundreds of different molecules, all of which end up giving us this, uh, this overall impression. And that kind of thing happens uh, even when you're simply warming something up. It doesn't take much energy what, uh, whatsoever to begin to change the materials that we're enjoying. And that's the key to cooking is, is yeah. taking the materials that nature gives us and making them more interesting. Yeah. I think the, um, the smell of onions cooking has saved a lot of people who are running late for the cooking of their meal because you just sort of put the onions on in the pan and sweat them down and everyone in the house thinks that the meal is sort of just around the corner even though you've just kind of three minutes in and again it is a sort of it's, it feels like a form of alchemy that this onion which is so kind of unsexy by itself just with with the combination of heat and some fat in the pan within five minutes is just filling the whole house with this incredibly kind of homely aroma it is it's sort of daily magic um uh james savage is asking a couple of questions about um this rabbit hole that you chose not to go down to and uh, sort of uh, in terms of memory and the subjective nature of of um of smell she said what is it about taste and smell that triggers memory and she also asks why do we like the unacceptable smells from our own body and not those coming from others um, so I didn't know if you wanted to talk about what you don't talk about in the book, which is which is this kind of massive subjective of, of rabbit hole of the subjective nature of it all, the Madeleine moments. Yes. Uh, so I, uh, when I decided to write about smell, then I had to think about the fact that there are there are two aspects to it. There are the molecules in the world that are emitted from things around us and that fly into our nose and trigger perception. And then there's the process of perception, the moment that it, it uh, hits our receptors and then gets into our brain. And, and that's where the sensation of smell or flavor, if it's a food, uh, that's where all that is generated. And I just didn't think that I could handle both in, in a single book. And as Your editor said, said no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, so I, I set aside the issue of what, what happens after the, the molecule hits our receptors. But that is another 
terrifically fascinating aspect of the subject. And in fact, um, it's, it's the, you know, it's just so difficult to, uh, and, but also uh, really intriguing to think about because we only know smells by our experience of them. You know, we, if we've never encountered that molecule before, then, then you know, it, it doesn't have any meaning for us. So what we end up doing is associating smells with uh, the things that they appear to be coming from. And we usually give the smell a name, uh, the name that belongs to the thing that it's coming from. So a lemony smell is lemony because it comes from lemons and uh, the smell of dog paws comes from dog paws and reminds us of the smell that comes from corn chips. We don't have a, a kind of abstract vocabulary um, the, the way that we do for some other things. Uh, and that vocabulary depends so much on an individual's experience. Um, if uh, I, I give the example in the book of uh, the Brazilian chef Alex Atala making it possible for some of us in the West uh, and the North to taste ants that are eaten in the Amazon. And the, the ants to us taste like ginger and lemongrass because they share the, those molecules. But Alex made the point that when he brought ginger and lemongrass to the Amazon, to the Amazonians, those things smelled like ants. So it, the, yeah. the, exactly the same molecules, but completely different uh, set of references. So of course, uh, experience is critical. And um, uh, without memory, we can't draw on past experience. And so the connection between the experience of smell and memory is very, very tight. and. Uh, there's also a, a kind of anatomical uh, aspect to this, which is that the sense of smell is wired very directly to the part of the brain that's associated with emotion and with uh, feelings of pleasure and disgust, which makes perfect sense because uh, one of the functions of smell is to warn us when we're about to encounter something that's not good for us. And so we have that kind of immediate connection. And then the, the kind of more, more general experiential connection that has to do with memory. Uh, all of these things are, are in the pot when we, <laughs> when we smell something. Uh, and teasing out which elements are most important depends so much on, on that particular occasion and the person and so on and so on. People talk about the smell of fear. Does, does fear have a smell? <laughs> it it uh, how to say this because uh, so um, fear uh, causes people to uh, perspire more strongly than they would be otherwise, and perspiration uh, carries chemical signals that include um, what we think of as as body odors and generally speaking try to get rid of and so. If someone is fearful and they don't have the chance to uh, shower immediately, then yes, the, the, the trace of that experience will be with them for a while. Um, there's another question that, that uh, just talking about how different smell is um, for individuals. There's a question, um, uh, does everything smell the same no matter where in the world it's at? Oh, that's Angela asking again. And, and I thought it was uh, interesting. Not only did you feel the need to invent a new word uh, amidst a 700 page book, you also then wanted to rename um, uh, petrichor um, with another word. So I wondered if you could tell us about that and how, I mean, sort of what petrichor is for those who don't know and how it means that the world does smell differently everywhere and what you renamed it. <laughs> well, yeah, so, um... Uh, fresh air is, is wonderful, but it smells different depending on where you are on the planet. And um, that really intrigued me why it is that um, the air out in the middle of nowhere 
has the smell it does. And it turns out that uh, decades ago, scientists uh, in Australia had investigated why it is that the, uh, the earth uh, develops a particularly um, noticeable smell when it rains after a long dry period. And they um, studied in particular the smells, the volatile molecules that come off of rocks that have been dry for a long period. And because uh, the smell comes off of rocks, they named the smell petrichor from a root meaning uh, rock or stone. And then ichor, which is the, uh, the, the um, uh, circulating fluid in the gods. <laughs> so uh, kind of like blood, but, um, but uh, immaterial. And so this was the, the, in a way, the essence of the smell of rocks. But uh, it turns out that the smell doesn't really come from the rocks themselves. It comes from the stuff in the air that ends up sticking to the surface of the rocks. And then when rain comes along, the rain dislodges that collection of molecules that has accumulated and releases them into the air and that's when we're able to smell them. So I think that rather than calling that smell, the smell of the rocks, petrichor, it should actually be thought of as the smell of that particular part of the world. And it's not just the vegetation, it's uh, industry, if there's industry, it's it, whatever's going on. And so uh, I chose to come up with the term Gaia Icor. <laughs> so it's the, the smell of the, all the living processes, uh, living and dead processes that are occurring in that particular place in the world over the course of those, uh, that, that period of time. Epic. Um, and uh, so yeah, 14 billion years, the galaxy, the world, the Gaia core. There's also a question from Samantha Hannah about whether you research the possible experience of smell of the unborn baby in the womb, whether you whether you managed to go on that kind of space odyssey. <laughs> well, uh, I I personally did not, but uh, there are uh, studies that have shown that uh, infants um, whose parents whose mother is exposed to particular smells will respond when the infant is born, the infant will respond to those smells in a way that the infant of a mother who was not exposed to that smell would. That is to say, uh, ex the, the, the mother, mother's exposure to smells influences the baby's experience in the womb. Um, and uh, again, kind of makes sense because you know your uh, the the mother is preparing the child not only to be uh, able to survive in the world, but giving that infant its first tastes of the world, its first sense of the world, and so uh, and um, many of the smells that um, that characterize the foods that the mother eats end up in her bloodstream and in the amniotic fluid and in her milk. And so uh, an infant is getting all kinds of information, kind of a, a preview of the, the smell world by virtue of its life uh, inside the mother and then uh, being nursed by the mother. Wow. Um. I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, Helen is asking, she's fascinated by the cultural differences in the experiences smelling, uh, say, for example, the durian fruit, which Southeast Asians smell as this is sweet and custody, whereas many Westerners describe it as disgusting. Um, is this conditioning or is there something else going on? Um, so again, a big kind of subjective question, but the actual, the, yeah, the actual experience is, you know, is it, is it language? Is it is it context? Is it association? Uh, yes, <laughs> all, all of the above. But I can speak directly to the uh, experience of durian because um, I, I went on a, an expedition to Singapore to, uh, to 
experience it to to uh, to understand what's going on with exactly the this kind of dichotomy: people who love it and people who are disgusted by it. And it uh, and I experience both. Uh, for someone who is not used to it, it's a it's a weird combination of sulfury, uh, oniony. Uh, compounds, oniony kind of at best, and maybe a little more disgusting uh, at worst, a combination of those molecules and the molecules that are typical of fruits, including things like strawberries. So the strange thing I think for people uh, from the West who have never experienced before is this kind of combination of sulfurousness and, and fruitiness. And it, it just comes off as being strange. But the more time you spent with it, uh, the more time I spent with it, uh, and the more I thought about it, the more I could appreciate that, you know, this is, um, you know, we, we could do the same kind of thing here by cooking onions and mixing, mixing them with strawberries. And it would be unusual, but it wouldn't be disgusting. So it, it really is a matter of um, the, the frame of mind uh, in which you experience something. And I think the advantage of um, uh, paying attention to smells and sort of interrogating our experiences of them is that they can broaden our palate, broaden our appreciation for things um, uh, in, in a way it wouldn't be possible if you simply take one sniff and you're disgusted and you never smell it again. That's all you're left with. But but in Southeast Asia, the durian is considered the king of fruits, and so you're missing out on something if you don't at least you know appreciate a little bit of of that uh, royalty. Yeah, it's just it's yeah. So it's fascinating, and just the context is the kind of the French smelly cheese and the kind of the teenage smelly talk can you know smell very similar, um, and yet one is kind of delighted and one is one is not. Um, maybe we can end our questions on. On, uh, on what your favorite flavor echo is. Um, I've heard you talk about a lot about uh, the, uh, the aga wood, the, the smelling of the incense in, in Japan, but, I, but, but do you have a, a, food, a food flavor echo that, that, you, that you're particularly tickled by? Uh, that's, that's a tough one um, because of course, the, the more that I uh, worked on this book, the more, uh, the more of those echoes I first uh, often would first read about um, and then go to the foods themselves and notice for the first time. So uh, it's an example of, um, you know, uh, experience at second hand. Uh, the molecules tell you that there is this connection and then you go and actually experience the foods and sure enough, it's there. One of the things that... Um, uh, that I really love is the, I, so I love coffee. That's, that's how I first discovered that I'd uh, lost my sense of smell. Uh, and one of the things I love about in particular Ethiopian coffees is the, uh, the note of blueberry that you can often have in them. And to me, that's, that's just mind boggling because you have, again, this, this seed that's been roasted to 400 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that, very high temperature, something that a blueberry would never survive. Um, and then you brew uh, liquid from it and you end up with this aroma of a fruit, uh, uh, a Northern fruit. It's um, yeah, yeah, just wonderful. Yeah. wonderful. Um, so we've got, we've had less than an hour to talk about a book that you spent 10 years writing, which feels kind of mad, but I know that um, a lot of people will be desperate to hear what your next project is, um, whether you're going back to food and cooking or moving on to site or what's, 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 the, what's the next 10 years? <laughs> well, what, whatever it is, I hope it's not going to be 10 years worth. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm actually... Uh, recuperating from this last 10 years. I, for, for eight of those 10 years, I was late uh, to my publisher. So um, I'm still still pondering. Uh, I, I think I'm going to come back to food though, because um, that's, that's where I got started. And I've, I now have a perspective on it that I really didn't have before. So I want to explore that. 
I think, yeah, I think a little Harold McGee novella would go down very well. And uh, I mean, but your, your publishers must be equally kind of excited and nervous about sort of what potential you could do in the world of food now that you've got Google available to you. So, uh, so we look forward to Harold McGee on food plus Google. So um, I think uh, sadly our, our time is coming to an end, but it's just been so interesting. And, and um, I just implore everyone to do a deep dive into Nosedive and Harold encourages us all or, or reassures us that we don't need to read this, this 700 page cover to cover. Um, it's, it's a field guide. It's not necessarily one you put in your pocket whilst walking around a field, but it's one that you can return to when you're out like Heston walking to the post office and smelling the cars of a, the, the wheels of a car. You can then come back to this book and, and dip into it. So although it's, it's, it's a big book, it's actually incredibly light, which is a mystery to me. Um, but I'm very grateful for Harold's reassurance that this is one that we kind of dip into and have around the house and just and just keep us smelling and and paying attention um, and uh, becoming better smell explorers. And as Heston said, to, to question and, and smell and hopefully taste everything. So thank you so much, Harold. Thank you, Tara. It's been a great, great pleasure. Thank you both so much. What a wonderful evening and discussion. I could have listened to you for hours more. I'm sure that everybody else could as well. There are so many questions coming in. Um, like Tara says, this book is completely riveting. Everyone needs to deep dive into it. If you are curious about dog's paws smelling of tortillas, if you're curious about Ethiopian coffee and blueberries, the book is just packed full of wonderful explorations like that. And it does make you see the world differently. So this was a wonderful uh, introduction and explanation to this book and this work and the world of smell. So thank you so much, Harold and Tara for just getting the 2021 food season off to the most wonderful start. And thank you also to our audience. Please do check into the British Library website for upcoming events. Don't miss, for example, this Friday, what is likely to be a very lively discussion between the Michelin star chef Tom Kerridge and the writer of Dudes, Diets and Diners, Emily Contois, uh, about masculinity and food, or indeed the conversation about French cooking and restaurants with the writers Jonathan Meads and Bill Burford and the restaurant critic Tracy McCloyd on the 21st of April, and there is much, much more. Please again do send us comments, we really love to hear from you, uh, the good, the bad and the ugly. Uh, uh, remember that there is a donate button if you feel so inclined to support our work. And finally, thank you again to our speakers this evening and to KitchenAid for sponsoring the food season. What a great start. Good night. <laughs>